is Owendale. This is Owendale. A community that you and your husband founded? Uh, yeah, you can say that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what's special about it? Special about it is the fact that we are only white people staying in the town. Yeah. Only white people are al al allowed to buy in the town. But I saw a black gentleman uh, on his way out just now. That's right. They're working for us, uh, but they're not allowed to stay in the town. We, as white people, aren't supposed to be ruled by blacks. Now, from the way we look at it, you see, you're not ruled by blacks. It's basically a, uh, a multiracial government. And second of all, what would be the problem with having blacks in the government anyway? Just the fact that because of our religion, it's not meant to be that. Mm. God created uh, not even animal as equal. If you look at nature, nothing in the nature is equal. Basically what it boils down to is he sees those that I chose. And, and who did he choose? The white people. So where does that leave non-whites? Well, the way we see it, they've got no chance. What about if you've just, if you're like one sixteenth non-white? No. Uh, one thirty-second. One sixty-fourth? That's basically what it all boils down, all boils down to. God doesn't want us to mix, and that's why we stay apart from the blacks. You make it sound almost as though we're a different species. Could be. Could be. Could be. Could be. Could be. Very possible. Very possible. Very possible. Very possible. Very possible. Why do we hate? We hate because we're taught to hate. We hate because we're ignorant. We're the product of ignorant people who have been taught an ignorant thing, which is that there are four or five different races. There are not four or five different races. There's only one race on the face of the earth, and we're all members of that race, the human race. But we, but we have separated people into races so that some of us can see ourselves as superior to the others. We thought it would work, I guess. It hasn't worked. It has been bad for everyone. But it's time to get over this business. I hear parents say this all the time. My kids play with black kids and white kids, and then they grow up. So am I to take it that you're saying that kids are not born racist? They are instead taught to be racist. There is no gene for racism. There's no gene for bigotry. You're not born a bigot. You have to learn to be a bigot. Anything you learn, you can unlearn. It's time to unlearn our bigotry. It's time to get over this thing, and we best get over it pretty soon. American people have taken labels that are used to describe different races of people out of context. Many believe there are other races of people because of the multiple languages people speak worldwide and the various skin complexions people will carry. But if skin complexions are used as a means to label a race of people, then why is there no such thing as red Americans, yellow Americans, or brown Americans? We can recall America's society exclusively applying the labels white and black as a means to describe particular races of people, but is it really because of their skin complexions only, or is it something else? Realistically, are black American skin complexions the color black, and are white American skin complexions the color white? The answer to both of these questions is no. However, Somehow, America's society of today is still utilizing these labels as a means to describe particular races of people by the color of their skin. But if their skin complexions do not reflect the colors that they are being associated with, then what does black and white mean when alluding to black Americans and white Americans and white Americans and white Americans? Now, let's cover some important key factors that allow us to comprehend what it means to be a black and white American. It is said that with the passage of the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which was ratified on July 9, 1868, after the American Civil War, 
This amendment granted citizenship to all persons born or naturalized in the United States, including formerly enslaved people. Learn you, enslaved people and formerly enslaved people in the United States of America historically consisted of various races or classes of people. So this 14th Amendment referred to formerly enslaved people and not one particular racially categorized group of people. This amendment became a significant step forward to the progress of granting civil rights and legal equality for all people. And yes, I said all people because within this 14th Amendment, it does not specify in descriptive detail which race or class of people these privileges will be granted to, which is an essential point to note. If you ever decided to read the 14th Amendment front and back, you would ascertain that the labels white and black were not utilized anywhere throughout its five sections to exclusively describe the people to whom this constitutional amendment was referring to. Two things occurred before establishing this 14th Amendment that you need to know and comprehend. The Civil Rights Act of 1866 was a law that officially didn't see the light of day until 1870 because then President Andrew Johnson vetoed the bill each time Congress passed it. Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1866, passing the Senate on February 2nd and then passing the House on March 13th, 1866, which defined the citizens of the United States, their rights and obligations, and penalized those who deprived any person of any right protected by this act because of their color or race. However, throughout the 10 sections of this bill, it needed to be descriptively specified in detail as to whom these persons this bill is referring to, especially when the bill mentions terms like color or race. Still, it does not, which leaves the civil rights of so-called black and white Americans unaccounted for so far and Democrat President Andrew Johnson vetoed this bill on March 27, 1866. Then on April 9, 1866, Congress passed this same bill again by inserting portions of it into the 13th Amendment. And of course, Democrat Andrew Johnson vetoed it again, but the chamber overrode this veto by a two thirds majority and the bill became law without a presidential signature. However, multiple members of Congress ruled that Congress did not yet possess enough power to overrule the veto and enact the law. So it wasn't until after the passing of the 14th Amendment in 1868 that Congress ratified the Civil Rights Act of 1866, four years later, in 1870. Again, there were no inclusions of descriptive labels like black and white added or utilized throughout the Civil Rights Act of 1866, nor the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution to specify whom these privileges are granted to. Why were these lawmakers so vague when writing their legislations? Was this done purposely? to allow particular people to make biased guesses or assumptions about who should be granted these privileges? Let's take the Dred Scott decision, for example, which occurred initially in 1856, but was decided in March of 1857, nine years before the Civil Rights Act of 1866, where the US Supreme Court ruled that Negroes were not citizens of America and that they would not be granted the same privileges of a white person that the courts are bound to respect. Now, we are told that this 1857 Dred Scott decision was superseded with the passing of the 13th Amendment, which was said to have allegedly abolished slavery, and with the passing of the 14th Amendment, which was said to have granted all people citizenship, civil rights, and equality under the color of law. But again, the labels white and black were not utilized nor descriptively specified within the 13th and 14th Amendments of the U.S. Constitution. So where does that leave so-called black Americans today if some may refer to themselves as such a thing? When you think about this all, wouldn't you like to know which laws protect you as a citizen of America? 
primarily since you are referring to yourself as a black American and no constitutional law exists that grants these types of privileges to a black American? And suppose you're in denial without properly researching what I am teaching you. In that case, you may want to ask yourself, who was the only group of people that continued to face various forms of disenfranchisement and discrimination, which led to marches and protests for civil rights, equality, the right to vote, and to be granted first-class citizenship throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, even after the 13th and 14th Amendments were made lawful? Was this specific group of people referred to as Black Americans, Negroes, Coloreds, Indians, or slaves at that time? Yeah, Indians, it's the same thing. Learn you, it was not specified as to whom these amendments are referring to, and you cannot afford to assume that the term slave was used to exclusively describe or refer to all so-called black people who were enslaved in America, because as I mentioned earlier, they were not the only enslaved people in America, and the term black was not being used inside of these amendments of the Constitution. Did you notice that these amendments never specified the citizenship and rights or privileges of white people either? This is why self-determination and assimilation are essential for people who do not know who their true enemies are because it goes beyond the Bible once the devil was revealed and places itself outside of it. The United States Census is a division of the U.S. Department of Commerce, employed and deployed by the federal government. People can recall the U.S. Census hiring census enumerators to travel from city to city and town to town to get an estimated count of the U.S. population. Still, the U.S. Census duties are much more complex than just counting heads of American families. The Census Bureau also collects comprehensive data on neighborhood housing conditions and demographic characteristics. In other words, they want to know where each race or class of people resides in what neighborhoods, what conditions they are currently living in, how many children reside in each household, whether it is a single-parent family or not, who is old enough in the household to be employed, and how many of that household are employed, just to name a few examples. The data is collected and utilized for multiple reasons, including allocations of federal funds, emergency and disaster planning, apportionment of congressional seats, and credit bureau redlining, for example. Well, many Negroes who have registered to vote have been evicted from their lands in Lowndes County people who have worked on, on plantations for 35, 40 years because they registered to vote have been evicted. The U.S. Census started in the year 1790 and has periodically changed the labels that they would use to categorize each race of people. They use labels such as slaves, all other free, all other free persons, free persons of color, coloreds, negroes, and mulattoes. However, the label white has never seen a change since the U.S. Census began to utilize it to categorize individuals by race, dating back to the first U.S. Census conducted in 1790. The Census was granted the privilege to report and define these various racial and ethnic categories. On a routine basis, if they assumed that an individual was not white, they would record their racial classification as non-white and whatever category they felt best suited the individual to accommodate the country's biased understanding of race and ethnicity. These motions proved to be highly detrimental for a so-called non-white person because it not only grants a stranger the power to identify an individual as whatever label they created for them, but it also deletes the actual existence of that said group of people, which allows them to become puppets under the dominion of whoever created the labels for them to be categorized as. People did not want to be labeled anything but who they were, because anything else would be just another nickname. 
But the federal government had other plans to make particular groups of people less than who they thought they were by instructing the census enumerators to categorize people they meet by derogatory labels created to discriminate against them specifically. The census of 1850 was the first time the categories black and mulatto were used alongside white as labels for racial and ethnic groups at that time. This is part of the reason why some people may find that their ancestors were labeled mulatto on the census because their ancestors were familiar with the label black being a derogatory term utilized against them, just like any other term that they did not create for themselves. Now, when I was growing up, to call a, a, a person of, of color like myself or others black was de considered derogatory. That's just a fact. You know, you call somebody black, those were fighting words. Those were fighting words. So some of them settled with the term mulatto as their racial category for that period with the thought that it was better than being called black. More about this in the next chapter of this video. It is important to note that the label black was not used by the U.S. Census as a means to categorize an individual only by their skin complexion, and neither was white because if you were labeled white by the U.S. Census, then it means that you could have European, Asian, Arabic, or African origins, exposing that you do not have to carry pale skin as your complexion to be categorized as white. Hmm. Did you notice that if an individual has an African origin, then the U.S. Census will label them as white? What does this mean? It means that a person can be darker than dark complected and remain labeled white as their race category, exposing the labels black and white as a status with the government and not an actual color of skin. Do you really believe you have a black life? Do you, do you want me to read to you the meaning of black? Who called you black? Shouldn't you have rejected that from the beginning? A contradiction, a bundle of contradiction. You refuse Negro and ne but that's what black is. So you took the English version. And you know what black is? Tell me, have you ever seen black? Do you know the meaning of black? Black means the absence of color. Absence of color, absence of good, absence of light, absence of direction. That's the meaning of black. Black is not a color. It is the absence of color. Don't you understand it? They keep laughing at you as you call yourself black. They keep laughing at you. Open any dictionary. Find out the meaning of black. And tell me if you find anything good, and you are not black. Not at all. Not at all. You gotta change it. The same way, the same way Negro became a racial slur, black should be labeled a racial slur when it is used in connection with you, with you, with you, with you. So now, what does it mean to carry the status of white and to carry the status of black with the government? The ruling elite, or those who welded power during colonial times, drafted an idea to create different ranks of positional status that can only be determined by a governing body of a country. Just like the operation of a corporation would consist of various positional statuses or ranks within their managerial boards, overseeing committees, or throughout the organization in general ranging from the highest rank to the lowest rank, and each person entitled to a rank given will be obligated to perform the duties or occupations that their specific rank will require of them. You will find this method of ranking authority embedded within any institution, a military, and within the civilization of a colonized country.
This is what it means to be civilized, to respect the authority above all uncritically and its compulsory way of living life it bestowed upon you. It's hard for today's society in America to swallow the pill of truth concerning how their enemies established a social and cultural development problem without ever leaving their seats. If I were to ask you when this black versus white racial issue began, some of you will say around 400 years ago. Some of you may say within the 1960s, and a few of you may say during the year 1492. But if it is a white supremacy issue, then realistically, what does the label white mean since it is not referring to skin color? Just after Bacon's rebellion that took place in the colony of Virginia in 1676, which lasted over a year, the British ruling elite sent lawmakers and extra troops to the colonies of Maryland and Virginia, who were ordered to disband all local unions of indignant workers, servants, and slaves of all racial groups that jointly rebelled against their militant stronghold during Bacon's rebellion by way of manipulating legislature that will entice prejudicial separation among them. Making its first appearance ever in history in the colony of Maryland's anti-miscegenation law during the year 1681, the label white was created through a developing legislative strategy known as divide and conquer to give rank or status to specific people who were granted special treatment and privileges by the governing body of the British colonies of America. Lawmakers of Virginia sent letters to the London Company, better known as the Virginia Company of London, informing their authoritative overseers of their divide and conquer strategy to prevent future revolts and rebellions from occurring throughout the lands they sought to colonize. So the implementation of the brand new label white as a racial category was then elevated to become the highest status a worker, servant, slave, landowner, business owner, etc. can be considered by the governing body of a colony. The status of white granted particular people a variety of special privileges like, for example, being able to buy more land at a highly discounted price, purchase expensive items with automatic discounts attached to the final cost, granted higher wages as workers and tax breaks as owners, skip to the front of lines of waiting people, and enjoy the feeling of being above anybody else that does not carry the status of white. The divide and conquer strategy consisted of several laws passed to create another status that fell directly to the bottom of society called black. These slew of laws prohibited people carrying the status of black from marrying people who were under the status of white and prohibited people under the status of black from holding public office and possessing a weapon. According to these newly formed laws, once their indentures of servitude expired, those who were considered to be under the white status were immediately paid goods and received guns and gunpowder. Also, persons under the black status were prohibited from suing and testifying against persons under the white status in a court of law. It is essential to note that prior to the existence of these divide and conquer laws, the people who were indigenous to these lands of America accepted the laboring assistance of formerly enslaved new immigrants from Eurasia and jointly lived their lives without prejudice. Because if it weren't for the indigenous people of America, then the incoming waves of immigrants from Eurasia that were escaping their homeland slavery would not have survived to expand their presence throughout America. So when the British government authorized the creation of white people throughout the British colonies of America, they purposely did not define the label white as a matter of law still today, 
so that the incoming immigrants from Eurasia could feel more deserving of these privileges to have a better life in their new world, drastically far away from their old world. If an individual had no clue that these laws were being passed, they immediately fell to the bottom of society under the status of black, regardless of skin color and those who were informed on what was taking shape consented to be under the status of white, believing that they were a part of the ruling elite class, which was another part of the divide and conquer strategy called the illusion of inclusion. The first Congress that was held in America during the year 1790 signified that the status of white was lawfully supreme by the creation of citizenship through the newly formed naturalization law of 1790 called an act to establish a uniform rule of naturalization that required all citizens of America to be white only. This act remained an act of law until the year 1952. You heard that right. Let me say it again. This act remained lawful from 1790 until the year 1952 with the passing of the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1952. Regardless of what laws were passed in between these years that you may believe superseded it, which is the main reason why during the late 1950s and 1960s, many black-led groups and organizations protested against the governing body of America for the call of equality, justice for all, civil rights, the right to vote, and guess who? First class citizenship. Listen, and since the statuses of both labels, black and white, have not changed still today, then neither has the privileges and types of treatment they will bring to an individual's life expectancy that considers themselves as these labels by governmental documentation, employment applications, credit applications, identification applications, marriage certificates, birth certificates, military records, driver permits, and even by word of mouth between their family, friends, and associates. The status of white means you are recognized or present within this country while the status of black means the total opposite. You are null and void, dead or absent within this country. Most of you Negroes. I'm not insulting you, I'm just saying you're dead. That's what Negro and Negro means. This gives a whole new perspective as to discovering a previous family member of yours who is labeled white on census records of the past. Because, as I mentioned earlier, the U.S. Census did not only utilize these labels as a means to describe particular races of people by the so-called color of their skin, but also by the governmental status they hold within this country under the color of law. I'm just here to make you think. So dance. Yeah. So good.